As it turns out, I failed to properly introduce my friends Molly and Dylan from Woodbrew. If you don't already know them, be sure to check out their channel and subscribe. They make videos just like I do, and they're all over all of the other social media networks. Again, I'll have links in the description below. Hey folks, how you guys doing? Hope you're all having a great day today. I only have one microphone, so I have to do this rock star style. How are you guys doing today? Pretty good, actually. Yeah, thanks Pretty for having good. us. Yeah, I'm doing good too. We're all doing good. They just got... They just, they just, what do you guys do? You just went on a long road trip. Mm -hmm. It's like three weeks and they're finishing up the road trip. Stop by and we're going to make something. So it's going to be a one day build challenge, I guess. Although we, we all did our homework here, so it shouldn't take long <laughs> at all. And actually we're shooting this after it's done. So it's not difficult at all. So what are you guys going to make? We're actually going to make an outdoor planter. You're going to make or you already have? Uh, we haven't made it, but we're <laughs> going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm making something for them and they're making something for me. So if you want to see what they made, check out their video and you're going to see mine. So here we go. <laughs> oh my God. I'm just going to leave it. That's mine. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> For this project, I actually made a prototype out of three quarter inch birch plywood, which is something that I normally don't do. Uh, but three quarter inch plywood, it's plenty strong enough for this project. So if you go the plywood route, just know that you can fit three complete chairs on a single four foot by eight foot sheet of plywood, which is pretty cool. If you go the solid wood route, you can get the entire chair out of a single eight and a half inch wide by 16 foot long board, which is the exact size of this four quarter ash that I'm cutting in this video. And actually, I only used 13 or so feet of it, so it's, it's a little bit less than what this board is. And for a simple common dimension reference, you can get one entire chair out of two eight foot one by 10 boards. After a rough layout, my next step is breaking down the long board into more easily manageable sections at the miter saw station. And by this point, Molly and Dylan were already rolling on their build, so we went back and forth sharing the miter saw, which is something that I'm not really used to. The ash I'm working with is rough sawn, so in preparation for the planer, I stacked all the pieces in the correct direction to feed them through the machine, and right about here I realized I should have made one more cross cut to separate the side pieces. But back at the miter saw station, Dylan had already set the stop block for a batch cut operation, so I didn't really want to mess with that. So no big deal. I'll make the cross cut with a slightly less powerful saw. Finally, the boards can be joined on one wide face and then planed to final thickness. Now for these chairs, there is no exact thickness you need to get the boards to. I'd say anything between one half of an inch and three quarters of an inch is fine. And as a matter of fact, I think the side pieces here were a little bit thicker than three quarters of an inch, just because at that point they were already flat and the only benefit of further reducing the thickness was to reduce weight. Also, having someone catch the stack of boards coming out of the planer, that's a luxury I'm not really familiar with, and it really helps out a lot. And of course, I did the same thing to help Dylan plane his project pieces as well. With the grain on both wide faces exposed, I can determine what direction to joint the edges. And this is only necessary on the smaller pieces that the slats will be ripped from. I can also trace the templates onto the boards to be rough cut at the bandsaw. But before we go to the bandsaw, let's first talk about the templates, which I do have available for purchase on my website. The whole point of making these templates was to make this chair incredibly easy to build as it eliminates figuring out the radius for the overall shape, it eliminates laying out and locating all of these slats, and it provides a perfect spacing between all the slats. To use this template, you need a flush trim bit with a one half of an inch or less cutting diameter, and you also need a one quarter of an inch radius roundover bit for the slats. So here's my recommendation on router bits. Bit number two in this image is a one quarter of an inch radius roundover bit. This size roundover bit is necessary for the slats. Bit number one is a one half of an inch diameter flush trim bit. And because it fits in the template perfectly, 
and it's a little bit more rigid than say the one quarter of an inch diameter flush trim bit. My plan was to use just this flush trim bit and this roundover bit to show you that you can get by with just two bits. However, as an investment for long-term shop use and to have many more options in the future, my recommendation is to pick up a larger flush trim bit to do the majority of the work and then a smaller diameter bit to be a little bit more versatile and get into the tighter areas. Bit number four is one that I've had for almost a year and it is, it is a beast. It can chew through quite a bit of material at once due to the cutting diameter without digging in too aggressively due to the supporting material behind the cutting edge. Bit number three has a 1 8 of an inch radius. So while it does a great job at getting into tighter areas, I wouldn't want to stress this bit too much with the you know excessive waste removal tasks. One thing to notice about all three of these flush trim bits is that they are spiral bits. You can get the job done with lesser expensive straight cutting bits, but this is a proven you get what you pay for a situation. Straight bits cut in a chopping action where spiral bits have a slice cutting action. So under the exact same demanding situations, a spiral bit will stay sharp longer and produce a cleaner surface. Bits number one and number three have down cutting spirals going into the bearings, which is where the template will be. So this means that the wood fibers will be supported by the template as they are cut, which will result in a tear out free edge. And bit number four, this is a combination bit, meaning it has cutting edges going in both directions. With all that said, it was time to rough out the side pieces at the bandsaw, getting, I guess, about a quarter inch or so close to the traced template. The closer you get, the less work that the router bit has to do. The templates were then attached to the wood with a few pieces of Nitto tape, which is probably the best double-sided tape that I've ever used. As I start routing, I want to touch on a little bit of safety advice, and that is, if you don't feel comfortable doing something, then just don't do it. Here's an example. Using push pads at a router table is often considered as the more safe way to use a router table. And from my own personal perspective, I completely disagree. When using push pads, I feel completely disconnected from the material, kind of like there's a barrier between me and the task at hand, which there is, and I see it like using boxing gloves to help catch a football. And I'm not telling anyone out there that you should or shouldn't use push pads at the router, but I am saying over the years of trying to use them at the router table, I always feel much safer and in more control by firmly holding the material with my hands rather than the push pads. At this point, I realized I left a bit too much material when rough cutting at the bandsaw, so I went back to the bandsaw and made a bunch of quick relief cuts. And because I had a one inch wide resawing blade on the bandsaw, these relief cuts, they're just quicker and easier uh, to make than trying to get into the curves of the template. Later in that day though, Molly and Dylan said that these tabs that I'm cutting off, they were actually being shot across the shop at them. So while the relief cuts were a good idea to reduce stress on the router bit, they weren't such a good idea with other people working in the shop at the same time. Just one of those things that you don't realize when you're in there by yourself. The seat support legs will have one slat that is captured in a slot, and the slot is sized for a maximum thickness slat of three quarters of an inch. So I used a three quarters of an inch Forstner bit to remove the bulk of the waste followed by a few quick cleanup chops with a chisel, and then more template work back at the router table to get this slot perfect. Now, I don't think the chisels were entirely necessary, but it did reduce the chances of the bit grabbing on one of those ridges between the holes. With one set done, the templates are popped off and then applied to the second set, and the process is repeated. Now for this set, I wanted to see if using the larger flush trim bit would speed things up, and I think that it did, but there is the trade-off of having to change router bits. The larger bit, it makes really quick work of the majority of the templates. And then it was back to the smaller bit to transfer the smaller radius areas to the work pieces. Next, the slats can be ripped out of the remainder of the stock at the table saw, and I ended up having about 40 inches of extra material after getting the 15 slats that I needed. So really, I only needed about 13 feet of that 16 foot board that I started with. 
Each slat will get a round over on all four of the long edges that will match up perfectly with the template. So with the fence installed at the router table, this is a very quick and easy process that can be knocked out in just a couple minutes. Now again, I feel much more safe holding the material with my hands rather than using push pads. Before leaving the router table, I used the same roundover bit on all the edges of the seat and back supports, starting and stopping as the bearing hit the slat supports, and of course, not routing the areas where the slats will be. The last step before assembly is to cut the slats to their final length, and you'll have a little bit of wiggle room here as the width, width of the chair, it, it's really up to you. I cut these at 19 and a half inches long, which means the chair will be, well, 19 and a half inches wide. Assembly is incredibly easy due to using the template for the sides. I started with the back support, clamping the lowest slat in place, making sure to have one quarter of an inch overhang on both sides. Then the second to last slat can be installed by drilling pilot holes to prevent splitting and securing with two screws per slat. With only the first slat still clamped and this second to last slat secured with screws, the assembly becomes rigid and you can quickly move through the rest of them. The top slat only has alignment on one side, so it should not be used to establish rigidity and instead should be installed last. Then the rest of the slats are added and a straight edge is used to quickly align them with a one quarter of an inch overhang. Rinse and repeat with pilot holes and screws. Lots of repetition. With the assembled back upside down on the table, the seat section is assembled in its nested state. The seat supports slide into the back and are clamped to the back sides with a couple spacers. In my case, I used four 1 16th of an inch drill bits, which will result in 1 8th of an inch wiggle room when nesting the chair. If you don't have four 1 16th of an inch drill bits, then four evenly sized nails will do the job just fine. Even, even really four pencils would work. Just make sure that the seat sides are clamped parallel to the back sides at an even distance from the ends, and make sure the clamps are not so tight that they bow the side pieces. Then the seat slats are installed the exact same way. Make sure there is the same one quarter of an inch overhang on each side of the back sides, drill pilot holes, and secure with screws. Finally, the last slat is added to both the seat and back assemblies, and the outermost screw in this case needs to be installed at an angle to prevent splitting of the end of the side pieces. The very last slat installed is the captured slat in the seat assembly slot. And the whole point of this is to add a little bit of rigidity to the ground side of the seat assembly. And this slot is sized for a maximum thickness of three quarters of an inch. But the slat should still be installed even if you are using one half of an inch thick stock. One mistake I made here was leaving it long while attaching it. This is the only slat that should be cut so that it is flush with the sides. It is secured with screws in just the same way, screwing through the bottom. And here you can see me trimming the captured slat flush with a handsaw after realizing the mistake that I had made. That's basically it. This is, this is one of the quickest and easiest builds that I've done in a long, long time. The seat nests inside the back of the back for storage and transport, and it slides into the front of the back to be used as a seat. And if you're wondering how much weight it will hold, just know that I am approximately 2.4 Molly and Dillons, which is about 200 pounds, and it held me with no problem. I'd be willing to bet that this chair made out of plywood, it could easily hold 300 pounds. That's, that's just an opinion there. Don't quote me on that. The last step is to give it some really good outdoor protection, and for that I sprayed a few coats of Halcyon. I think I'm pronouncing that right, Halcyon from Total Boat. It's a durable outdoor rated finish that dries really, really quick and it cleans up with water. It also gives it a very slight amber tone, gives the wood a very slight amber tone. So unlike water-based polyurethane, this really highlights the wood grain, similar to the way oil-based finishes do. It looks much better than any of the water-based finishes that I've used in the past, which is easy to apply, but they, they give the wood a, a milky, muddy, dull look in comparison. This is just as easy as a water-based finish to apply, but you get the added benefit of the beautiful look 
that an oil-based finish will give. And of course, Molly and Dylan have been enjoying this chair ever since, like the ending of a fairy tale, happily ever after. <laughs> they like to travel, and I'm sure that this chair will get a lot of use from them. But, as I mentioned earlier, we were building something for each other. So head on over to their channel and see what they built for my wife and I. And my wife actually put it to use the following day and really likes it on our front porch. So there's a little hint for you. If you're interested, I also have one of these chair templates available for sale on my website. And that's pretty much it. You guys take care. Have a great day. Check out Molly and Dylan at Woodbrew. And I will talk to you in the next video.